And we've been walking through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're going to continue this series for a while, but it will take some different forms and fashions. Just this other day, I was uh, posting on a group of ministers and was talking about uh, our church lobby and some people had some different ideas. Anyway, uh, an evangelist friend of mine said, hey, uh, this is a great idea. You should put some new light bulbs in. And uh, I put the new light bulbs in and it looks really awesome. And he goes, I won. And I said, all right, well then you get to come and speak. So that's what he wants. So he's gonna be coming uh, July 13th uh, to come and speak and share with us. But we're just gonna continue through hearing from God, learning from the life of Jesus and how the life of Jesus impacts who we are and what we do. If we think about the term, uh, the, the title, Live Like Kings, God has called this to live like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was a king over all things. He had all power. He sat on a throne, but he didn't establish his kingdom like any earthly king did. Every earthly king before him and after him were, were always wanting, was always desiring, always had emptiness inside of them that led them to take and to take more control. But Jesus, having all things, being the king of the universe, already having established his position that is above every other name, he comes and he established a kingdom in a totally radically different way. Where everybody was expecting him to bring his authority and bring his position and dictate and lord over, Jesus lorded over by serving and offering himself. And so we've been going through Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, talking about what it means to be blessed, what it means to live like a king. And some of these areas challenge us. I would say all of them challenge me. As I look at the Beatitudes and I think about how am I to live like Jesus, and today again is no exception. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7, it says this this morning, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is a challenge to me. God blessed me in my marriage to marry to Rachel, who is full of mercy, full of compassion. I love the way she works with children and the way she cares for people who are sick and in need. But I tell her constantly, Wow, it challenges me. It challenges my very nature, the way God maybe made me, or maybe my flaws show up a little bit too much. Denver, oh, filled with the same kind of merciful, compassionate heart. We were walking to the mall uh, for Mother's Day, actually, and we went out, uh, we got purchased mom her little tinker tink right from the uh, mall, and we're walking out to the car, and there was somebody that came up to us, and this is Denver, every time he sees it, whether we're walking on State Street and there's somebody with a sign and need, they hey, how can you help me? Or whether we're walking through the mall parking lot on Mother's Day, somebody comes up to us, hey, how, uh, I need some help. And Denver always, he turns to me every time, he's like, Dad, what are you going to do? You've got to do something. And every once in a while, I'm the rude guy that just walks by and doesn't say anything. And Denver goes, Dad. Why didn't you do something? You're the pastor. You need to do something. I was like, okay, all right. Let me grow in this. So today, as I'm preaching to you and, and sharing about mercy, I want you to know I'm receiving this too. I will work on this, and I will be one that is full of mercy. Why? Because our Savior Jesus was one that was full of mercy. Mercy comes, I believe, first with this understanding if we're going through the beatitude, with the understanding that we are spiritually bankrupt. It comes from a heart that, that grieves sin. It comes from a 
a heart that has learned to meekly wait on the Lord for his vengeance and not take it upon ourselves to, to bring vengeance, to bring about our agenda, to bring about our desires. It, it comes from a heart, as last week that we heard, it's blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. From this heart, then Jesus jumps into, because of these things being true of who you are, be merciful. Mercy comes from mercy. God has been merciful to us. Amen. It's imperative that we understand the amount of mercy that has been shown to us. And when we fully grasp, and sometimes it's difficult because we walk our life and we think we have things in order. We become comfortable with the blessings of God. We become comfortable with joining together with family on Sunday morning. And we've been comfortable with the fact that we have the Word of God with us at all times. We can pray at any moment and we know we can have, have communion with the Father. But we have sometimes forgotten the mercy that was shown us. That while we were yet sinners, while we were the enemies of God. Man, I really wanted to, and I still don't have the boldness to, I wanted to bring up a diaper up here from, one of the, from the nursery and just get the mental image of just how disgusting we were to God apart from what Jesus did. Mercy. The Father God showed us mercy. The Savior Jesus showed us mercy. While we were his enemy, while death was on us, while there was nothing for him, there was, there was nothing to be, there was nothing uh, like, like that, that, that benefited him. There wasn't something that he was like, all right, if I get this, I'm going to gain it. Because he, remember, he is the king. He already has it all. And at that point, at the point of our lowest, at the point of our separation from him, and us like dirty rags, God came to us, demonstrated his love for us. This morning, we sing of the song, I'm no longer a slave, I, I'm a child of God. He saw us at our weakest point and said, I love you. And he demonstrated this great mercy. What we owed was death. But yet, he came and gave us life. He came and gave us freedom. He came and gave us position in his kingdom. To be one that is full of mercy, it's imperative that we cultivate a view of who God is and what he has done, what he says about us, with all of our heart, with every joy, with every virtue, with, in every distress, our life is owed to the free, undeserving mercy of God. Amen. Amen. We owe everything to divine mercy. Jesus made clear through several illustrations what mercy is not. And from these stories, from these illustrations, we can learn what mercy is. What we can do to be merciful. And so first, we're going to look at Matthew, and we're going to go to, the, to chapter 9. So if you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be in verse 10 through 13 together. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 10, and it reads this way. As Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And then when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner. Right here in the middle of this passage, Jesus declares, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
Jesus says to, to live like kings, we got to be able to live in our hearts. Affection towards him and mercy towards others. Well, he's not interested in religious rights. So he, he's not interested in, in keeping all the order. The problem that the Pharisees and the, the leaders had at this morning this moment was not the mercy that Jesus was showing in meeting with the senators and, and the tax collectors and, and those with a, a bad report, but he was, what they were upset about in this moment was that to be with this group of people would have been ceremoniously unclean. Jesus, if you are, if you are the religious leader that you are claiming to be, why would you be with such a people that would leave you in a uh, in an unclean situation? Why would you ruin your reputation by being with people of ill reputation? If he was speaking to us today, maybe he wouldn't necessarily go after our religious vigor. Uh, the fact that we would dress per certain ways or, or schedule our time in a certain way. But maybe Jesus would directly speak to our desire to keep the status quo. To be set up. So don't you, uh, aren't you worried about your reputation at work? Aren't you worried about your reputation in your neighborhood when you're hanging out with those kind of people? Jesus views sinners as sick, miserable people in need of a physician. He knew who he was and what he had to offer, and the very people that needed what he had were the people who were in his audience, the sinners, the tax collectors, the ones that overtook people and, and took advantage of others. The people who were in need were the exact place that Jesus found himself. They were sick and in need of medicine, and Jesus had exactly what they needed. Pharisees only saw this as a problem of the unclean. It's difficult to think about this in the way of the status quo. What's hard for me is when I get into this moment of, of helping people in, and maybe you've been in the same place. I, I think about helping somebody, and then I think about all the other things they could do with the money that I'm about to give them. I think about all the different ways that, that they've abused the system already, or I think about all the ways that they could get in further trouble, or, or how, how is my help really helping them? And, and Jesus here, he, he, he speaks to the, the Pharisees, and, hey, these people are in need of the very thing that I have. And, and the, the Pharisees were caught up, and we'll see this in the next story again, with all the trivial things about the situation and how it would affect Jesus' holiness, his, his righteousness. But in this moment, Jesus said, the greater need is that I would be with them, for they are sick. And they are in need of medicine. They are con the Pharisees were concerned more about the preservation of themselves rather than, than, rather than those who are dying without Jesus. Jesus didn't show you mercy so that you can have the best, most put together life. He shows us mercy so that in return, we show the same mercy towards those who are in need around us. Amen. The opposite of, it, of mercy is when our religious impulses are exhausted after you have decided whether to tithe on your gross income or your debt or your birthday gifts or your, or your next advancement. But don't ask me to give more. I've already done my religious duty. I've already given what is necessary. I've already went to church this week. I've already went to the Bible study this week. I've already read my Bible this week. Don't ask me, Lord, to do one more thing. To be one full of mercy is being willing to be used to the greatest exhaustion of who we are for the benefit of the eternal life of somebody else. The religious people of the day were so caught up in what was right in the order, and they've done it, and they've made helping others something that was trivial. 
Jesus responds to them in the Beatitudes by saying, Blessed are those who show mercy, for they shall receive mercy. We've got to divorce ourselves from this attitude that I've done my duty. I've already done my part. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When we have been bound to this trivial understanding of what's the right way to help and, and I've already done this thing and, and this is my duty and this is how I've accomplished it, we, it, it begins to become the curse, to the, to the curse that leads to a life that is unmerciful. Sometimes people ask <laughs> In my heart, when Denver says, hey, why, why can't you help this person? Uh, hey, Dad, why didn't you do something there? God, Dad, why, why didn't you pray for them at least? Dad, why didn't you answer them? Dad, you could have bought them a hamburger. You could have bought them an extra fry. You... And I'm, I hate admitting it, but sometimes I think to myself, you know, why does it fall under my duty to save the world, you know? <laughs> Like, why is it me? Why is it there across my path? I'm just being honest this morning. I've already done this, this, and this. Yeah. As we look at Jesus' next example, he encourages us not to neglect the weightier matters of the law. Justice. Mercy and faithfulness. Jesus is teaching us that as kings we must pinch ourselves over and over and over again to make sure that we are not looking out for our best interest, but more what is best for our neighbor. Blessed is the merciful. Make war against of the religious spirit within us that would say, I've done my part. I've done enough. I've done what is required of me. For this is anti the kingdom of God. Mercy is not trivial, trying to figure out which way I can help, what things I have done. Mercy shows to the nth degree that I will go to the end of myself for the sake of your eternal life. Let's turn together to Luke chapter 10. And we'll see how a merciful person should act. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, we find a maybe familiar story of Jesus approached by a lawyer, asking who is his neighbor, and, and Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And within this story, we again see so much of what it means to be merciful. And I believe it will encourage us this morning. So Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, it says this, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, to put Jesus to the test. And he said to him this, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all of your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him there half dead. 
Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him in an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell to the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What is the picture of mercy that is given here in the story of the Good Samaritan? First thing, if we want to be a people that are full of mercy, the first thing that we see is that mercy sees distress. In verse 33, Three, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and he saw him. He saw a need. He was aware of the need. He saw that he was beaten, in this case, beaten half to death, ripped of his clothes, in desperate need. If we are to be a people that are going to be full of mercy, we are to be a people that have to be able to see distress. Oh, so we're going to have to maybe get outside of our normal bubble so that we can see what is going on around us. See where help is needed. See where the distress is taking place. But one who is full of mercy doesn't just stop with seeing the distress. The second thing that we see here, that mercy responds eternally with a heart of compassion. Or with pity or it's a person in distress. So, what was different between the two responses, right? The Good Samaritan, which we'll see in a couple points, he, he wasn't supposed to be the one in their minds to answer this call. It was supposed to be, it says here, the priest and the Levite. So the priest is the one that's in the position of ministry, the, maybe the, the pastoral person that you could think of, maybe all eyes are on me, so maybe you could think, all right, it's the duty of the pastor, I should have, and, and Denver gets me all the time, Dad, you're the pastor, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to respond, all right, this story lives out still today, but the Levite, and the, the, so, the, so the priest would be a, a minister, would he would be a pastor, right, he should have been the one to respond, the Levite, we can all look at Amy. No, uh, the Levite was the worship, the, in charge of worship. These two individuals should have been ones to help. Oh, but remember those ceremonial laws of uncleanliness. Oh, they couldn't get their hands dirty. It, it became a triple matter. I see somebody dying, wounded, stripped. Laying on the side of the road, but all of these other things kept them from showing true mercy, from caring for the individual that was most in distress right before their eyes. So what does mercy do? It, it sees the distress, but it responds with a heart of compassion. The heart of a Samaritan in this moment it says that in verse 3, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. His heart was broken. I've got to do something. This unction within Denver that comes so natural. And it, I've got to do something. And it leads to number three example. Mercy responds externally with practical efforts to relieve the distress. Mercy responds 
with practical ways to relieve the distress of the one that is broken. What did the Good Samaritan do in this matter? He, he bound up the wounds. He, he poured oil and, and wine on them. He set them on his own animal. He took them to the end. He, he paid with his own money. He did it. And he took it upon himself because he recognized that he had what was need necessary and maybe it even cost him severely, but he chose, I want to not only have compassion, all oh, the poor people that are in need, all oh, those who are sick, all oh, the poor person that, that doesn't know who Christ is and is going to hell. Like, it doesn't just stop with a, a moment of compassion in the heart, but it leads us to practical ways of living out this mercy that requires sometimes, oftentimes, maybe even every time, sacrifice. Mercy sees distress. It responds with compassion. It practically tries to meet the need. And fourth, mercy acts even when the person in distress is an enemy. Mercy acts, even when the person in distress is an enemy. This point of the story here is really like a sucker punch to this lawyer. He, he makes the, the, the best scenario, the best character in the whole story, somebody who shouldn't have had no business responding in this way. The Samaritan, a half-bred Jew with warped views about religion, stepped in to help the Jew who hates him. If you're looking for an attaboy, a reward, a, a, a status, a, all of a sudden, hey, look at me and look at what I've done, that is the opposite of what mercy is. That then takes on the same religious, uh, yeah, the, the same spirit as the religious people of the day. Look at what I've done, Jesus. These are the things that I have in order. No, mercy, no matter what the cost, no matter what's in it for me, even if the people hate me, I show mercy. Mercy is not for friends or for conveniences. Mercy has an eye for distress, a heart for pity, an effort to help in spite of them being an enemy. The question remains today, do you have eyes to see? Do you have the heart to break with compassion? Do you have the willingness in your heart to say, in a practical way, I'm going to meet a need? Returning to the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We serve a merciful God. Will he find that his mercy has affected the way we live? Because the Father God moved with the same kind of mercy that he illustrated in this story. He saw us in our distress. He saw us without him, in our sin, heading towards death. He responded with a heart of compassion and said, I must do something so that all may know me and live in my love. And he responded externally by sending his son Jesus even to the point of death. And he acted even though we were his enemies. Today, as we reflect on what it means to be merciful. The challenge for us today is to go and do likewise. 
Go and live mercifully. And it's easy to do it for each other. But the stories and, and the way that this is written encourages us to do it for those that can't repay us. Do it for those that it brings no glory to yourself. Do it for those that are lost and dying and without Jesus they have no hope. Do it for those so that you may also see the mercy of God shown in your life. Go and do likewise. Go and be like the Father. This morning I want to take a few moments to reflect on this. And maybe the prayer that we can pray together is, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may see the distress around. Open my eyes for the opportunity that you have given me to show mercy to others. Open my eyes and, and maybe even open my hands, open my time, open my life so that I can meet practically the needs that are around me. And all of this for, and all of this so, that there may be an eternal reward. This morning I want us to respond in two ways. The first way I, I believe that we can respond is, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my heart, open my life that I may show the same mercy that you have shown me. But the second response every time I hear the message of Jesus, I can't help but give opportunity for those to respond to the message of Jesus. That while we were apart from Him, while we were enemies of Him, while we were afar off, while we were so dirty, we were like dirty rags, He demonstrated His love for us, His mercy for us, by coming to us living the life that we couldn't live, and dying on the cross, paying the penalty for the sin, for the judgment that we owe. And this morning, we have another opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, become Lord of my life. And so this morning, let's bow our heads to reflect on these two points. One, Lord, open my eyes that I may show mercy. And two, making a decision, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness and your lordship in my life. Let me pray for us as we reflect. Father, I thank you again for your word that is sweet to our mouth, your word that is power to us, your word that is life to us. Today, again, you challenge us. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Father, I pray that we would be a people who are full of mercy, who eyes are open, who ears are open, whose heart is open, whose hands are open to serve those in distress. Because, Jesus, you served us at our greatest point of need, bringing us life instead of death. God, I pray that you would minister to us this morning as we pray to you. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears and our hands that we may be merciful in Jesus' name.